If the entire Colorado River system is sitting on less than two years of water at current use, would you feel like we are recovering or still one bad winter away from trouble? This week, we will look at a rare bump in reservoir storage, California's sinking canals, Arizona's big water import dreams, and a new salmon floodplain that might quietly help keep taps running in your city. And we will close with the latest drought monitor, which has some sharp warnings for the West. Welcome back to Western Water Weekly, a roundup of the week's news reported by western-water.com. Let's start big. The entire Colorado River Basin. Utah State University reported that October and November brought something we almost never see anymore, a short-term increase in total reservoir storage on the river. As of November 30th, the basin held about 24.63 million acre-feet of active storage. That sounds like a big number, but here's the catch. The system's recent consumptive use and losses were 12.7 million acre-feet in 2024. In other words, the river is holding less than two years of supply at current use. So yes, storage ticked up, but it ticked up from crisis to slightly less crisis. And here's the part no one is talking about. Where that little bump actually came from. Most of the gains came in a few key spots. For one week in October, Lake Powell actually took in more water than it released. That has been rare in recent years. Powell gained about 105,000 acre feet that week, a 1.6% bump, thanks largely to strong San Juan River flows. Even after losing water in November, Powell finished the two-month period with a net gain of around 52,000 acre-feet. Lake Mead did not get much direct help from storms. Its small increase came mainly because Hoover Dam cut releases, about 485,000 acre-feet sent downstream in October and 415,000 in November. Put together, Powell and Meade gained about 25,000 acre-feet over those two months. That is a rounding error in the long-term picture, but an important psychological shift. For once, the line on the graph did not just go down. The San Juan Basin was the real standout. Reservoirs there gained about 197,000 acre-feet, especially in Navajo and Vallecito. Meanwhile, reservoirs in the upper Colorado and Green River basins still lost water overall. So, quick reset. The Colorado River got a brief, much-needed pause in its decline. But with less than two years of water in the whole system and a dry winter forecast, we are still operating right on the edge. Looking at California, Three different decisions tell us how the state is trying to manage risk in a climate that keeps throwing curveballs. In the San Joaquin Valley, the Department of Water Resources released a major study on how land subsidence, literally the land sinking, has damaged canals and aqueducts. Decades of pumping groundwater faster than it can be replaced have caused some canal reaches to drop by more than 8 feet since the 1960s. In parts of the California aqueduct, that sinking has cut carrying capacity by about 44%. The friant Kern Canal lost so much capacity in one area that deliveries dropped by roughly 300,000 acre-feet back in 2017. When canals cannot move high flows during wet years, that water is more likely to spill or never get stored at all. Farmers and communities then fall back on already stressed groundwater, which makes the sinking even worse. The study's conclusion is blunt. The first priority is not building brand new canals. It is stabilizing groundwater levels and fixing what we already have. And here is where the controversy begins. Because fix what we have usually means tighter groundwater rules and higher costs for someone. A little farther north, up near Sacramento, California just launched the first operational season of the Big Notch Project in the Yolo Bypass. Think of this as a giant, controllable side door off the Sacramento River. Managers cut a notch in the Fremont Weir and installed three big gates. When the river is high enough, they can open those gates and spread water across the Yolo Bypass floodplain. Why does that matter? Because juvenile Chinook salmon grow much faster in shallow, food-rich floodplain water than in the main river channel. 
Biologists call them floodplain fatties, and those extra inches can mean better odds of surviving the journey to the ocean. The project cost about $58 million, with the United States Bureau of Reclamation putting in roughly $41 million. It is also a working farm landscape and part of California's flood protection system, so managers have to juggle fish, food, and flood safety all at once. This is one of those projects that does not look flashy, but it quietly helps California meet environmental rules that, in turn, allow the big statewide water projects to keep operating. On December 1st, the Department of Water Resources set the initial state water project allocation for 2026 at 10% of requested supplies. 10% might sound scary, but it is really a cautious opening bid based on early season conditions. Statewide reservoir storage is about 114% of average for early December, and Lake Oroville sits at 100% of average, slightly higher than this time last year. Last year's allocation started at 5% and ended at 50%. Something similar could happen again if storms keep coming and the Sierra Nevada builds strong snowpack. Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which serves nearly 19 million people across six counties, responded by emphasizing its storage. Metropolitan expects to end 2025 with about 3.8 million acre-feet in storage, matching a record set in 2024. That storage, spread across groundwater banking, surface reservoirs, and local partnerships, is the region's safety net. It allows Southern California to ride out low allocations on both the state water project and the Colorado River without hitting panic mode every single year. So in California, the big picture looks like this. The ground is sinking under key canals, salmon are getting new floodplain nursery habitat, and the state water project is starting cautiously at 10%, while Southern California leans heavily on its storage reserves. Turning to Arizona, leaders are asking a huge question. If the Colorado River cannot reliably carry the load, where else can the state find water? On November 19th, the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority of Arizona, often called WIFA, advanced four large water import proposals into a new study phase. Two developer teams are involved. Axiona Fengate will study a desalination concept in Mexico, while EPCOR Water Innovation Partners will look at three other ideas. Here is the menu. A desalination plant on the Gulf of California in Mexico, with treated water exchanged for part of Mexico's Colorado River share a potable reuse plant in California that would produce high-quality recycled water for Mexico, again tied to a Colorado River exchange, and a California groundwater storage and recovery project that would let Arizona help store surplus runoff in exchange for a portion of California's river allocation. This is the part no one is talking about. Every one of these ideas depends on complex international and interstate politics, not just pipes and pumps. The projects are moving into what WIFA calls Phase 2. That means detailed engineering, environmental and cultural review, regulatory work across multiple jurisdictions, financial modeling, and community outreach on both sides of the border. None of this will happen fast, and none of it is guaranteed to happen at all. But the fact that Arizona is spending time and money studying desalination, reuse, and interstate groundwater banking at this scale tells you how serious the state is about finding water beyond its current slice of the Colorado River. Not all water stories are about new supplies. Some are about taking responsibility for old messes and making sure the systems we rely on actually work. In Southern California, the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board has proposed a penalty of nearly $600,000 against the Boeing Company. The issue is stormwater runoff from the former Santa Susana Field Laboratory, a 2,850-acre site in Ventura County that once hosted rocket engine tests, small nuclear reactors, and chemical research. Monitoring between January 2023 and March 2025 found 39 violations involving dioxin, metals such as lead and mercury, and other pollutants in stormwater runoff flowing into nearby creeks. Those creeks are not drinking water sources, but they are still part of the region's aquatic ecosystem, 
and they have carried the legacy of contamination for decades. There is already a broader cleanup framework in place for Santa Susana, overseen by the Department of Toxic Substances Control and the Water Board. This new penalty is a separate enforcement step focused on recent runoff, and it will go to a public hearing in February 2026. Up in Utah, there is a different kind of protection story. The Utah State Historic Preservation Office has signed a first-of-its-kind agreement with the United States Army Corps of Engineers to streamline how cultural and historic reviews happen when projects affect wetlands and waterways under the Clean Water Act. If you are trying to build a road, a subdivision, a mine, or a utility project that involves placing fill in a river or wetland, Federal law already requires a review of potential impacts on historic or cultural resources. Utah's Historic Preservation Office has built a reputation for turning those reviews around faster than required, often in less than 15 days and more recently in about a week. The new agreement is designed to reduce the need for hundreds of individual consultations each year while still protecting archaeological sites, historic structures, and cultural landscapes. In theory, it gives applicants more predictability without sacrificing the places that tell the story of the region. Finally, a quiet but important development in Washington, D.C. Members of Congress are pushing to renew and expand the state and local cybersecurity grant program, which has sent about $1 billion over four years to help state, local, tribal, and territorial governments improve their cyber defenses. You might be wondering why this matters for water. Many drinking water and wastewater systems depend on networked technology, remote controls, sensors, billing systems, and more. When those systems get hacked, entire communities can lose services or see their operations disrupted. A House bill known as the Pillar Act would extend this grant program through fiscal year 2035. It would also expand eligibility to include operational technology systems and systems that use artificial intelligence, as long as they are owned or run on behalf of state or local governments. And the federal response? In this case, it actually surprised some observers by focusing hard on small and rural communities, not just big cities. The bill directs the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to do more outreach to rural governments and to promote no-cost cybersecurity services they can adopt without big budgets. If you live in a small town where the water department has exactly three people and one overworked computer, this kind of support can be a big deal. Before we close with the weekly drought report, let's take a quick trip to Rocky Mountain National Park. Park managers have launched a new planning effort to deal with the long-term decline of riparian wetlands, those willow-filled, beaver-engineered strips of life along streams and rivers. Wetlands cover only about 4% of the park, but they support nearly one-third of its plant species, including most of its rare plants. They provide seasonal habitat for about 45% of bird species and one-fifth of mammal species. Over the last century and a half, People drained wetlands for ranching and recreation, altered vegetation, and removed top predators like wolves and grizzly bears. Elk were reintroduced without the predators that once kept their numbers in check. Moose joined the party later. The result? Heavy browsing on tall willows, fewer beavers, and shrinking wetland zones in places like Horseshoe Park, Upper Beaver Meadows, Moraine Park, and the Kawanichi Valley. The park has been doing restoration work since 2008, fencing, planting willows and other shrubs, managing elk numbers, and researching moose impacts. Now it is inviting the public into a broader planning process to figure out how to protect what is left and rebuild what has been lost. If you care about headwaters, biodiversity, or just beautiful high country meadows, this is one to watch. Let's wrap up with the December 4th U.S. Drought Monitor and what it means for the Colorado River Basin. Nationwide, the picture is mixed. Recent storms helped parts of the West and other regions, but many rivers remain low and pockets of drought are expanding again. For the Colorado River Basin, the big story is snowpack, and it is sharply uneven. The Upper Colorado Basin sits at about 53% of normal, 
while the lower Colorado Basin is a bright spot at 121%. The Great Basin, which includes much of Nevada and parts of Utah, is only 39% of normal. California tells the same story. Strong early storms in the south and along the coast, but very weak snowpack statewide, only 39% of normal. The southern Sierra Nevada is at 78%, but the northern Sierra lags far behind at 17%. Across the basin states, Nevada shows short-term improvement, but still suffers from low Great Basin snowpack. Utah improved in the southwest, but remains dry elsewhere. Colorado saw degradations in central and north-central regions tied to below-normal snow. New Mexico worsened in the southeast. The Rio Grande Basin is about 64% of normal. Wyoming is mixed. Some areas improved, some slipped. Arizona benefits from strong early snow in the lower Colorado region, but is still in a mostly dry forecast zone. Looking ahead, the National Weather Service expects heavy precipitation in the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies, while most of the Intermountain West, the Desert Southwest, and the Great Basin stay mostly dry. The 6- to 10-day outlook calls for warmer-than-normal temperatures across much of the West and below-normal precipitation across the southern half of the region. So even with a few welcome storms and a rare storage bump on the Colorado, we are heading into winter with low snowpack in many key basins and a warm, mostly dry outlook for the southern west. What are you seeing on the ground? Creeks rising, dropping, or disappearing altogether? Let us know in the comments. For details about these stories or for freshwater news delivered every day except Sunday, visit western-water.com. Thanks for watching and make sure to subscribe for next week's Western Water Weekly.